All my doodles on my homework in, in high school, they were eyes and people and hands and then just nesting words. And I don't know if you understand that, but it's just taking words and playing with words and fitting them together and making different designs out of words. And The Texas Hill Country is one of the most beautiful places on earth. In this podcast, recent Hill Country resident Tom Fox visits with the people and organizations that make this one of the most unique areas of Texas. Join Tom as he explores the people, places, and their activities of the Texas Hill In this episode of the Hill Country Podcast, I have local Hill Country artist Diane Eichsman who talks about her painting and work. We're in for a real treat today because I'm visiting with Deanna Eichsman at the Deanna Eichsman Studio. First of all, Deanna, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. So we met last weekend, the weekend of the 4th, at the Hunt Art Fair. And it was the first time there was such a gathering in Hunt. There were several local artists and I met you, my wife and I met you, and we're really intrigued by your work. And so I wanted to sit down and just visit with you about your background and what you've done. So can you tell us where you grew up? Sure. I grew up in Jones Creek, Texas, which is south of Houston, near Lake Jackson, if you're familiar with that area. I've lived in Texas a long time, and I've <laughs> never heard of Jones Creek. And if your reference is Lake Jackson as the city. <laughs> it is. Yes, there's one caution light and a couple gas stations, and that's it. <laughs> okay. Where'd you go to high school? At Brazosport High School in okay. Freeport. Right. Yes. All right. Where did you go to college? I went to Baylor. So I played volleyball for them, went on a scholarship, played volleyball for them, um, was going to be a physical ed teacher and coach. That's what I wanted to do. But I started missing my art and took art classes. And the more I took, the more I missed it. And uncle suggested I go graphic design because that's where the money was, <laughs> only to find out I hated it. Yeah, I had an oil professor that tried to influence me to go and study oil and that be my degree. And I just couldn't imagine what I would do with an oil painting degree. So I stayed in graphic design and never really used it. I hope the money part's right because my daughter just graduated with her degree in graphic design. And it's changed a lot since then. There's a lot of computer work. It wasn't computer work when I was there. Everything was uh, very detail-oriented, and it was all done by hand. And so there was a lot of discipline involved, a lot of, and you'll see that in my animals when you look closely, there's a lot of detail involved. And I think that's why I became so detailed. And I do several types of painting. You're probably going to get to that. So I'll just wait. <laughs> well, before we get to that, uh, did you go to Baylor before Branch Davidians? Yes, I okay. did. <laughs> Waco was a very different place then than what it is now. It was, yes. And uh, so the home refurbishment shows and a lot has changed in Waco and I grew up in Central Texas okay. so Waco was actually the big city because yes. I grew up in Bryan and Waco back then was a sleepy little town with not much going on so how did you was it comfortable for you coming from a really small town to go to Waco or what was that experience like for you I loved Waco in high school I was well known and was involved in very a lot of things lots of things art student government, athletics, and just everything. And then going to Waco, it was quite a bit bigger. And I grew up in a modest household. We, My dad worked hard, and my mom stayed at home, and she was a full-time mom. So it wasn't like we came from a money background, and a lot of those kids did. And so it was really strange getting there and, and feeling a little out of place for a while. And so the volleyball team became my family. And then the art group became my family. And so that, it was different. To me, Waco was still a big city because I grew up in the little one town caution light. <laughs> so yeah, it was big for me and it was quite an experience, but I did enjoy it. The, you mentioned a little bit earlier, you started missing your art when you were in college. That yeah. indicated to me you'd been doing it for quite some time growing up as a girl. Could you tell us about your early experiences and what type of art interested you before you went to college? Sure, so I lived out in the country, as you well know. We had huge pecan trees around us, huge. And I always drew. I don't remember not drawing or coloring as a kid. 
And when I was 10, my mom, I guess she saw something in me because I wanted to paint a picture on my wall in my bedroom. And she let me. Not very many moms will let their 10-year-old go and paint a picture on their wall, but I did, and it stayed there all through high school and into my college years. The one thing I'm going to say, though, is because we really didn't know that much about paint, I used tempera paint. And if any of you guys out there know tempera paint, it bleeds through for a very long time through kills and everything else. So that was the one mistake. We had pink on the wall in places that it wasn't supposed to be pink. But I did that and in high school and middle school just started drawing and my art teachers saw something in me and they kept pursuing me and any kind of competition came up, they would put it in front of me, here, let's do this, let's do that. I was pretty shy as a kid. And so if it wasn't for my instructors pushing me, I don't know if I would have continued it. I don't know what I would have done, except I would have done it in the background. But because of their love and support, I just kept drawing and kept painting. And yeah, I just started missing it when I got in, ho in college and started doing athletics. And it seemed like that was my life there. It was live, eat, and sleep, the gym, and <laughs> volleyball, and the weight room. And Not that I didn't love that, but I did miss the creative part of me. So when you picked that back up starting in college, did you have an area of interest or focus, or was it just, I guess I don't know the question to ask, was it just drawing? Sure. No, when I started back in college, I just started taking different classes, and I really loved the figure drawing classes because to me it pushed me out of my comfort zone. I wasn't used to drawing people, though all my doodles on my homework in high school, they were eyes and people and hands and then just nesting words. And I don't know if you understand that, but it's just taking words and playing with words and fitting them together and making different designs out of words. and. It was just a little bit of everything. It really wasn't until later that I started focusing on one or two different things. But yeah, I did pottery, loved it. Did graphic design, loved it. I loved the challenge of it. So anytime a professor said, no, that's too hard, you can't do that, and my athletic side came out, I'm like, oh yeah, let me show you. And I always ended up with an A or an A+. Plus. So art was super easy for me and just a natural. And I never realized it. And I never really valued my art because it was so easy. So it wasn't until a few years ago that I started valuing that it was something that was a gift. Yeah, I would stay up super late in the hallways while I was in the dorm, and people just knew that, oh, Deanna's going to be out in the hall doing her art. <laughs> so I just loved it. What did you do after college? I got married, moved to Colorado at that time, and had some little ones. Worked in a frame shop for a number of years, and that was really I really liked that because I met some really fascinating artists and learned how to frame. Learned, I actually taught people how to frame as well. That's because how the frame shop worked. And while in that frame shop, there were several different artists there that we just challenged each other and we talked about art and the different styles and how to use oils. And it was just, I don't know, it was just like minds coming together and challenging each other. And then meeting a lot of artists that came in, people who quilted, people who did pastels. Um, Atkinson, I don't know if anybody remembers him, but he was an amazing watercolorist, and it was fascinating. My, this, the place where I worked faced the mountains, so you constantly watch the sky change and the lights hitting off the mountains. And I think that was a huge influence in my life, too, just watching the skies and the colors. Where in Colorado? Near Boulder. So Longmont and Lafayette, and then I worked in Boulder. The in on your website you do talk about how living in Colorado influenced you and the way you saw landscapes and the colors. I was wondering if you could maybe describe that a little more. And I love your story about how the light would hit the mountains, but down to like the trees or the grass or I assume you hiked if you were Absolutely. being an athlete. So <laughs> you saw those colors up close Absolutely. and far away. What was that like? Oh, it was just unreal. If you spend any time with me at all, you'll notice that when I'm walking around, I don't just walk. I feel like I observe everything. And I'm. It, this was pointed out to me through a couple of friends. I didn't realize I did that. And that was different. But as I walk, I'll touch the trees and the leaves and I'll look at them and I'll see the colors in them. And I'll stare out my window a lot of times and see how the sun plays off the shadows of the trees and how the lights change with the day and how the clouds reflection change the way the colors bounce off the trees and the skies in Colorado were just almost so you could reach up and touch the clouds and then when the sun sets the way it just bounces off the mountains and 
the oranges and the pinks and the purples and the layers of colors upon layers of colors. It's almost as if though you see a different color every day when you really look. And then when the mountains had the snow come in or the rain came in, it just re caused different reflections in the atmosphere. It was just beautiful. I still do that today. So that was very influential on me. And as you look at some of my landscapes, you'll see some of those bright colors. It's just what I love. So what brought you to the Hill Country? Well... My husband's best friend lived up here, and he actually was building up here, and they've been best friends since middle school, and both of them are very creative in their own way. My husband's quite the artisan with wood and metal, and there's not anything he can't do or build or fix, and it look amazing. In fact, he's built quite a bit of my frames. He had been coming up here helping his best friend build their home. And as we would come up here, I just, this to me is a little bit like Colorado, yet in Texas, where I can be close to family. And I just always said, if we ever have an opportunity, I really want to move that direction. And God opened doors, so we walked through them. And when I moved up here, I started working, well, you'll notice at Goat Creek Cutoff, there's Blue Sage Hall. Yes. It was vacant for about 12 years, and I just kept seeing it as a wedding and event venue. And my husband's best friend's wife was a bookkeeper and knew the gentleman that owned it and put us in touch. And I shared my vision. I drew things out and sketched things out. And he liked what he saw, and he believed in me. And so we just started renovating and turning that into a wedding and event venue. Did that for several years, and... That was my life. I also noticed that my weekdays were empty, so I started running sip and paint classes out of there. Met a lot of amazing people through the weddings and events and the sip and paints, and I still have some of those same folks follow me with what I do now. The church started coming and in about 2017, I believe, and Deanna started growing and the church started growing and it finally just had to be where I had to find my own place. So I moved over here where I am currently and did some sip and paint classes and then good old COVID changed that. But it was a blessing for me in that it really pushed me into allowing me just to do my art and focus on what I do. I started doing a couple animal portraits. People started seeing them, started asking for them, requesting them. And my business just kind of, it did its own thing. And I think whenever you're in your zone, that happens. Love doing animals. I'm a big animal person. My dad used to call me Ellie Mae, and that kind of refers back to the Beverly Hillbillies, oh, the, yeah. the young blonde that always had a critter under her arm. That would be me. And so I just, I love animals. I love their eyes. I love trying to capture how they look into your eyes and their expressions and who that animal is. And it's the essence about it. So between landscapes and animals, that's pretty much what I do. So you've got a couple of collections mentioned on your website. I, I wanted to ask you about those. Yes. The first one is called the Contemporary Realism Collection. How do you define that and what's in it? Sure, that's my animal collection. Just uh, I do a lot of wildlife, exotics, and I call it Contemporary Realism because I don't really do realistic landscapes in them. It's more of a wash in the background because I like the viewer to imagine where that animal is. Is it in your backyard? Is it on the side of the road? Or are you out in the mountains? So I do a wash, and it's very contemporary and very loose. But yet the animal is very realistic, and it's one that I want you to be able to feel like you can reach out and pet the animal. And that's how I do that. So the one of the things that's amazed my wife and I here in Kerr County is the yes. amount of wildlife. I know. I love it. <laughs> and it is everything from deer to fox to squirrel the feral pig, possums, the armadillos, the aviaries, the birds are just delicious, and I'm sure I've missed many more. Do you get a lot of inspiration from the wildlife here Absolutely. in the Hill Country? Absolutely. I thank God for iPhones because I always have mine with me, and I have over 12,000 photos on my iPhone right now because I'm always taking photos of either the scenery or animals. And now I've gotten to where people know me for doing exotics, and I know several people that live or work on exotic ranches, and so I've been invited to a few, and many of them have given me permission, hey, if you're looking for something, just reach out to me. I'll send you all the photos I have. So that's really been a plus, and I love the fact that there are so many places around here that I can pull from. My daughter, my oldest one, is a photographer. She's an artist herself, and every once in a while I'm like, hey, do you have any pictures of this? My sister-in-law is a photographer. i got a lot of people in my life that really help with inspiration. Yeah. The next collection is called Now and Forever Collection. What's that? Ah, yeah. Doing weddings and events. I kept thinking there's got to be a way I can incorporate my art in this. 
And so I started looking at bouquets and thinking, when we got married, people gave me trinkets, little souvenirs, so called of your wedding, like little trivets or little, I don't know, just different things that looked like a wedding. And after a while, I got tired of looking like a wedding in my living room or in my home. And I thought, there's got to be a way to incorporate those memories into a living situation to where it's not yelling, it's a wedding in here, to where it's, oh, that's a sweet memory. And so I started taking the bouquets and really zooming in on them and capturing flowers so that it can go somewhere in a bedroom or a living room. And it's your wedding bouquet, but you would have to tell people that's what that is. And then lately I've been asked to do some live wedding paintings. So in November I'll be doing that where I go and sit at the wedding and have conversations with the bride pre the wedding and find out what they're wanting to capture and actually capture the scene, whether it's at the altar, whether it's the first dance or the first glance, capturing that and actually painting it during their ceremony or and after. So not only will I be capturing that and they'll have it, but it'll also be a form of entertainment for the guests to be able to watch and enjoy and ask questions. Probably when we got married, it was a lot of still photography, and then it became video. Yes. And now I'm hearing actually, I want to say retro, but going okay. back to an earlier art form that many people are coming to appreciate. How is that conversation? I think right now brides are just wanting something different. And I think art has taken on a whole new appreciation in that world, and people are fascinated. I know that when I do shows, I usually have my canvas sitting out, and I'm always painting or have something available to paint. And people are fascinated. Not everybody has had the opportunity to learn or have somebody pour into them. And I believe everybody is creative, even though many people will say they're not. I believe they were born creative and that either it was stifled or either it was enhanced and brought out. And so everybody tends to be fascinated and they don't know what it looks like at the beginning stages. And so a lot of times I'll have something out at the beginning stages or at the advanced stages and people will begin to ask questions. And I can answer their questions and show them. And a lot of it encourages them to look for look more into how they are creative and what they can do to be creative. I've also found art to be extremely healing. Um, this isn't on my website, but I do work with women who've been in sex trafficking and using art and prayer as a way of healing their hearts. And I've also worked with people in assisted living homes to where they have dementia and they don't remember things. I've had a dear lady I worked with for two or three years and it began to be where I was one of the few people that she recognized and knew. And I worked with her up until she passed and I would just go and sit with her and we would paint. And it got to be where I was drawing the painting out for her and she would paint, but she looked forward to it and you could see it, see it heal her in the way that she was able to bring memories back from the past that she might not just sit and bring out in a regular conversation. I've also worked with a lady that had tremors really bad, and she came to one of my classes, and in two hours' time, she went from not being able to hold the paintbrush without just really shivering, she couldn't paint a straight line, to where the tremors just really went to almost non-existent during that two hours of time. It's just amazing to see what art can do and how using the other side of your brain and allowing God to work through art can really make a difference in someone's life. Let me go back to your remarks around using art and faith to help heal yeah. uh, in sex trafficking. Yes. I understand the faith part. Yes. But can you explain how art can be used as a healing mechanism oh, for to. women or men who've gone through that horrific experience? Absolutely. I think it can, it's not only just sex trafficking. I think it can heal in many ways. I think PTSD, I think that is definitely a way of doing it. What I do is when the girls come in, we pray with them. And we faith is very much intertwined in it. We pray with them talk to them and I'll start asking them what they see or what God's telling them and I'll give them either paints and paintbrushes or chalk and paper or clay or just several different things and we'll set it in front of them and I'll ask them a questions and just say what do you feel coming what do you feel that God's telling you just use this it, God can speak to you in many ways it could be in a literal form it might just be in shapes and colors and so as they would do these things, they would literally 
God would start speaking to them and their emotions would come forward. And we always have a box of tissues nearby because if I'm not crying, they are. And it's just a great way of God just being able to speak through them through actual touching and using things and putting things on paper. And literally, sometimes it is just colors. But colors are healing. Colors mean things. Colors have a way of touching your heart down deep that you just don't expect. And I truly believe walking through the mountains of Colorado, not only does the environment speak to me, but the colors in the skies. I think that was a great way that God was able to speak to me, too, personally. So I, just colors are amazing. Art is amazing. So one other group of mm-hmm. portraits you specialize in is animals. Yes. And pets. And I think you're a proud fur baby mama. I am, definitely. Why animals? Why are they so unique? And how do you really bring out the emotions of animals? Yeah, sure. So I've done people before, and I'm getting back into it. But early on doing people, this is what I say. Animals don't complain about the way you paint their nose, but people do. Uh, So animals don't complain. People love animals. And like art can heal, I believe that being around animals can heal and help settle and emotions and just bring ground you would be a great way of doing it people love their pets and like humans they don't live forever unfortunately so i think that by doing pet portraits it's a way of commemorating and remembering and bringing back good memories and animals like i said ellie may hello i just love them there's such a peace about them and i feel like you can learn so much by watching them they're very intuitive and i don't know what else to say i just love them So I like watching them, I like watching their actions, and I just try to catch a little bit of them on the canvas. And I think the best way of bringing them alive is trying to capture their eyes and the glisten in their eyes and that little instinct of, what are you doing in my territory? Or, hey, you're welcome here. Or, what's going on? Or, oh, I see a bug. It's just, I think their eyes are everything, their expressions. I really like to watch their face and their lips and their nose and the way they hold their body. And it's just everything about them. I think they're just beautiful. So, Deanna, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time for this episode. But I was wondering if our Mm -hmm. listeners wanted more information on your work or your Mm -hmm. studio. What would be the best place for them to go? Instagram, Deanna Eichsman Art, or Facebook, Deanna Eichsman Art. And you can also visit my website at DeannaEichsman.com. And it's E I X M A N. <laughs> well, Diana, this has been great. I've really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me. Thank you so much for letting me share and visiting with me. And it was good to have you out at the show. Thank you. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Hill Country Podcast. I'm going to link to Deanna's um, Instagram, Facebook page, and other information in the show notes. I hope you will check out her stuff it is really great i really enjoyed meeting her and visiting with her she's doing some really interesting and i think significant work around uh, helping people through art she's a passionate woman about art and it really comes through when you have the chance to visit her i hope you'll join me again next week on another episode of the award-winning hill country podcast for a look at the people places and things of the texas hill country